We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we've been working on this episode for months. Let's not say we, let's say you. <laughs> you have been okay. working on this episode. I will give you all the credit here. <laughs> Yeah, this 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 was definitely a me-driven series that that we are going to be starting. Um, but I really wanted to do it. <laughs> no, and I'm happy to oblige, happy to learn. I want to know more about F1, but I don't necessarily have all the time to go back and watch an entire season. Um, so I'm happy to ask the questions for the people and and learn and you know let you watch it for us. So exactly. You. So in this case, I watched every race from the 2016 Formula One season. So you don't have to. Thank you. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. And Before by we... you, I mean, Emily, I mean, <laughs> listeners, I mean, I watched it. And if you have questions, ask away in the comments. Perfect. Um, well, yeah. I'm going to ask some of my questions here on the podcast, but yeah, definitely ask in the comments. Reach out to Catherine if you've got any questions, queries, or doubts um, about the 2016 season. And before we dive in to the 2016 season, Catherine, I want to know why specifically you chose 2016. Because when we talked about this originally, you're like, I have this really cool idea. I'm going to watch old seasons and recap them on the podcast. I thought it was a great idea you picked 2016 to start. So why 2016? Um, the answer in short is Nico Rosberg. Um, Nico Rosberg is the 2016 world champion, spoiler alert. Um, but he has, he, so he was driving for Mercedes and he made it very clear and makes it very clear to this day that he beat Lewis Hamilton in equal machinery en route to his championship. That is that is Nico Rosberg. Um, every time he does an interview, he brings it up in some way. And I really was just like, I need to see the context for this. And I, I had known that they had a, a very um, challenging professional relationship when they were teammates and that they didn't always love each other and it wasn't the best of experiences. And so I really just wanted to relive that and see what, what really happened in 2016 to bring, you know, myself, you know, more context um, when, when Nico Rosberg makes his digs at Lewis in, in media interviews these days. See if it's actually warranted or if it's just like really blown out of proportion. I mean, I knew it was warranted and it definitely was warranted. Um, but just like, you know, every sport has, has their, their big rivalries. And, and this is one of the biggest, especially in more recent years. And I really just wanted to see what it was all about. Well, there you go. Good enough reason for yeah. me. Exactly. Okay. So 2016 doesn't seem like that long ago. I'm still convinced oh 2000 gosh. was like five years ago. It was now 24 right? years ago, which is insane. So 2016 oh was seven racing seasons ago. But we still had some familiar faces. Can you kind of set the stage for us grid-wise? So who was on the grid at that time? Who's still on the grid? Who was on the grid that, like, maybe we are semi-familiar with because they just recently left the grid? Who who are we working with here, people-wise? Yeah, so 2016 was uh, the year of my quarter-life crisis um, when I quit my sports job. And while that was happening, um, these guys that we know today were on the grid in no particular order, but we have um, 11 drivers, Sergio Perez, Nico Hulkenberg, who back then were teammates on Force India, um, which is now Aston Martin. Fernando Alonso was with McLaren. Lewis Hamilton was with Mercedes, as we know. Um, Esteban Ocon um, was brand new to the grid. He was a um, mid-season substitution. Um, Daniel Ricciardo was still at Red Bull. Max Verstappen started the season um, at Toro Rosso before going to Red Bull. And we'll talk a little bit about how that happened. Uh, Kevin Magnussen was at Renault, right, um, which was the season before he made his way over to Haas, where he is now. Um, and Carlos Sainz was also at Toro Rosso. Valtteri Bottas was with Williams. 
Um, recently off the grid um, drivers who were driving back then, we've got Sebastian Vettel, everyone's favorite. Um, Kimi Raikkonen, also everyone's favorite. Um, they were both driving for Ferrari that season. Roman Grosjean was with Haas. Nico Rosberg, as we know, was the world champion with Mercedes. Daniel Kvyat started at Red Bull moved to Toro Rosso. Uh, Jensen Button had his, uh, it was a pretty rough last season of his his driving career. And then Felipe Massa, who is known now for his current litigation against the FIA for the 2008 World Championship. This was his, um, at, at the time it was his final season, but then he ended up driving um, in 2017. So this was his the penultimate season of his storied career. Awesome. Very familiar. Yeah. Which is crazy because, like, in F1, silly season, people move in seats all the time. They move around. People leave the grid. But we still have a lot of people that we're familiar with that were, you know, yeah. seven seasons ago, which I wasn't anticipating there'd be that many. Like, when we actually oh, count, it, it, count it surprised them out, me too. it's a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Actually, you know, looking, you know, watching it and, and looking at the grid, it's like, oh, I know who that is. I know who that is. I know who that is. But then really like seeing numbers wise, 11 drivers currently on the grid in 20, you know, coming into 2024 is is really it, it speaks to to some of the longevity that's a little sneaky. Like Sergio Perez has been on the grid for so long. Lewis Hamilton has been on the grid for so long. Fernando Alonso, current oldest driver, um, has say, been driving since the Stone Age. I would never. Um, so Check it's, it's the box. really interesting. We've aged Fernando via this episode. <laughs> Um, so it, it's just it's really interesting to see that that while there are some drivers who are who are only on the grid for a couple of years, there is really a lot of longevity in Formula One, which also explains why it's so hard to get and keep a Formula One seat. No, definitely, definitely. Okay, yeah. So those are the people who are on the grid, and then I mean, in the recent most recent years, we've had a lot of change up in the schedule with the U S adding circuits and those races coming on the schedule was the schedule similar back in 2016 or were there different races that we don't have anymore or ones that like we've have come and gone or what was the schedule like in 2016? Was it much different? This the schedule, I, I would call it pretty typical for what we know now or what we knew a couple years ago, when, uh, pretty much like when you and I were like just before we got into Formula One, it was kind of the typical type of schedule. Um, now we have a lot more Middle Eastern races, which is definitely ha has changed things a lot. And then, of course, this year with the regionalization of the schedule, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks once we get closer to things starting out. Um, but the, you know, it's. It, it's going to be very different from what, what it was nowadays. Um, there are four races that kind of stood out to me from the 2016 season that we either don't really know that we see or haven't seen or definitely won't be seeing again for a while. Um, and those are China, which I will only believe that we're going to be dri driving in China this year when lights go out and away we go. Um, I, I just, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, obviously Russia is no longer on the calendar for uh, political uh, global reasons that we need, do not reasons. need to go into. <laughs> Obvious reasons. Um Germany, um, we haven't been to Hockenheim in a while. That was that was a, a mainstay on the calendar for a long time. Um, and then most notably, in, in my opinion, is Malaysia and the Sepang track, um, which I feel like since I've gotten into the sport and started listening to podcasts and seeing media, I feel like Sepang is one of the tracks. It's like everybody wants to go back to Malaysia. And after having watched that race, I wholeheartedly agree. Okay, so let me ask you this. If you add Malaysia, personally, personal opinion here, if you mm -hmm. add Malaysia, what race do you remove? Saudi Arabia. That was easy. <laughs> I thought you I, had to think about it. <laughs> I, I, but now, no, 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 but actually, no, I, I knew you were going to say that, actually. <laughs> that 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 is not one of my favorite current tracks. Um, and so it is, it is definitely like I... 
I knew you were going to ask me that as you were about to ask me that. And I was like, I, I know exactly what I'm about to say. Um, you but I would, said it before I would, I finished the question. I did. Yeah. I, yeah. I would, I would sacrifice uh, Saudi Arabia for, for Malaysia in a heartbeat. If I was in charge, I should be in charge for the record. <laughs> We do make a lot of executive decisions on this podcast, so I'm surprised we're not Obviously. in charge at this point, but... Obviously. I digress. Okay. Well, yeah. I I think that would be interesting. I think having another race, like, we have Japan, we have Singapore, we have China, having another one, like, in that part of the world, I think would be interesting for the schedule, too. Then I, 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 I understand why there's so much more of a focus of middle middle eastern races and why so much money is coming into formula one from the middle east um but i would i would take malaysia back in a heartbeat i know that um south africa is another really popular track that people want to see formula one return to and also india is another one that they really want to um that fans are, are really vocal about coming back to so i i really I don't know how it would happen, but I, I would love to see it. And as we're recording this, they've just announced that they're going to be taking um, that Madrid is coming onto the calendar as a street race in 2026. And I'm just like, I'd rather have Sepang. Yeah, no, I, I like the change up of the schedule. I mean, going way off track here from our 2016 recap, but I do like the change up of the schedules and it's not like, oh, you only go to the same, you know, 20-something, however many races we choose to have in a year because it's always changing. But that's what's fun about yeah. it. You go to different you go to different circuits, some come back, some come for the first time, some leave, you know. It's interesting. So, I don't know. Yeah, I like I, we, we definitely can and should have a long conversation about Formula One and how the schedule works. Um, so, look forward to that one day. Catherine, I'm dying um, to talk about travel logistics. You know this. I Trust me, I know. Um, travel logistics is what Emily did in her previous lifetime working in sports back when we met. Um, and yes. yeah. I think they also quit in 2016. Did No, because I quit at the end of the year. You were in 2017. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Digress. Anyways, getting back to the 2016 F1 season. So I know you want to talk about specific races. I want to ask you about specific races too. But yeah overarching themes overarching what what are big key things that we should know about the 26 uh, 2016 season that might be different from the f1 we know of today or just notable things that happened in general that mm -hmm. are are good key takeaways yeah so what, what was really the 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 first thing that i thought of when when i started the first race of the year um i i can't I can't forget this was the the way the rear wings of the cars are so much smaller um and it just oh. it it was really like obviously we know that every every few years we go through a, a cycle of regulations and what the cars look like and and how how they're formed and you know the rear wing um of a car is so important and so prevalent now um yeah. but back and back then it just it was it was so much smaller and i was just like how do the cars go fast with that rear wing and the answer is the cars are slower back then because the cars have, have never been faster and that's that's how time works um and that's how development works so it was it was just it was really interesting um there was no halo back then this was the the second to last season without the halo um and i'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute when we talk about must watch races um the other thing that really stood out to me was how many more cars are lapped each race and how, how many more drivers have to navigate through blue flags and traffic. Um, cause I, I really think that that was, it's, it's, I can understand the, the value of it from a, a strategy standpoint. Um, and that it, it does add an extra layer of, of complication to a race strategy for, for a driver, for a team, whether you're in the front half or whether you're in the lap half. Um, but I'm, I'm really glad that we don't have, you know, 14, 15 cars that say plus one lap at the end of the race when you're looking at, at final results. I, I, I think that's, that's definitely one of the, the top things I've so noticed. Question just for clarity here 
So what you're saying is back in 2016, there was a larger delta between P1 and P20 than there is yes. now. Got it. Yes. Well, the other thing is it was P1 to P22. Sorry, we had P22. Teams. Yeah. We did have both. Sorry. Yeah. So sorry. Um, I confuse my years and how when teams are coming and going. I'm human. But no, but you're right. Um, there there is yeah. a much bigger, bigger delta. Um, and you have, you know, the the cars at the the forefront of the grid, the um the Mercedes, the Ferraris, the Red Bulls would overtake most of the cars on the grid, you know, the the Manor cars, the the Sauber cars, the the brand new Haas cars, because this was Haas's first year on the grid. Um, those would get overtaken like a lot of getting overtaken at the end of the race was common for most of the drivers on the grid. Um, and I, I like that we don't have that anymore. Yeah. Well, and isn't there, okay. I could be making this up. I swear I'm not, but maybe I am. Isn't there like a rule where if you're so far behind, like in qualifying time, like you don't even qualify to start the race. Like, if you're so many seconds, like you're the difference. I mean, it seems now ridiculous because from P1 to P20 on our current grid, they're all so, so close. So that would never even happen. But like, clearly there's that rule for a reason. So was that in effect at this point or was there not that large of a Delta in like single lap times? Technically, yes, that rule did apply. I, um, it is the hundred percent, the one oh seven percent time, um, which is a sporting regulation that says if a circuit is dry, any driver who is eliminated from the first qualifying session and fails to set a lap within a hundred and seven percent of the fastest time in that session um, will not be allowed to start a race without permission from the race stewards. That's what it is. Yeah. I knew there was so, a rule. So technically that rule exists, but they haven't applied it actively in a long time and they were not applying it this season. There were a Got couple okay. of times um, where there was like maybe one driver did not because he had a mechanical failure in F in Q1 and could not set a time. Um, but the, the steward just said, Yes, you can race. You're going to be in the back of the grid. Um, so it, it's not like the the 50s and 60s where you actually had to qualify within a minimum time in order to be able to compete in the race. Got it, got it, got it. Sorry to get us off yeah. track. I was just curious. Yeah, I, 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 always, I look at that thing and I'm like, context. Um, the other things that I noticed is um, there were a lot more retirements in the the race and a lot more a lot less reliability of the cars on the grid. So you would, you could see, you know, six, seven cars um, that were, were retiring, you know, some of them, sometimes it was crashes. Sometimes it was just, you know, a brake wire issue or, you know, the car in, in the case of Lewis, one, once his car exploded kind of. Um, so it's just the, the, the reliability factor back then was a lot different from what we see now where the cars are by and large, a lot more reliable, unless you're driving in like an Alpine or an Alfa Romeo, I'm sorry, a steak. Um, and there were only two races with no retirements at all throughout the entire season of 21 races. That seems crazy, but it also makes sense. Like seven years of advancement, really working on safety for like everyone, including the driver, which obviously would make the car more stable and reliable. If you're trying to protect the driver, the halo was introduced, like we were talking about. Um, so I guess that makes sense that you know it's more retirements than we see today yeah like yeah logically, and then if you the, think about it yeah logically it just it and also just kind of like it 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 was just I'm glad we don't see it anymore but there there are a few yeah. like minor things um what here's a big thing that I'm glad we don't have to deal with anymore um but 2016 was in part of an era where the radio usage was heavily restricted um, what? by what the yeah what engineers could tell their drivers there was like a list of like 25 things and anything that was outside of that list you could not say without being penalized which happened um a few times throughout the throughout the season yeah 
I'm sorry, but what's the point of a season if we don't get good radio content? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the the best radio content we got of of that year was really um, <laughs> um, Seb Vettel bitching about drivers not uh, abiding by blue flags. Um, but to to put an example, if there was an issue with the car. Um, that a driver could fix, like changing a setting on a steering wheel, his engineer could not say, here's what you need to do to fix it. Like you would have to figure it out yourself. And we wonder why there were more retirements. Also that, yes. Yeah, there, there, was, there was one race where um, Lewis was really struggling and there was an issue. And basically the, the answer was he had to figure it out while also driving 150 miles an hour. Um, and there was a race that Nico Rosberg got a penalty because his um, race engineer just went and told him what he needed to do to fix the issue. Um, and so he did get penalized. I don't, I don't remember if it was after the race or if he had to do a stop and go. Um, but it, he took a penalty and then they finally changed the, they changed the rule about two thirds of the way through the season and said, um, if you have to tell your driver something to fix the car, um, the driver has to basically do a stop, go through the pit lane. That's so stupid. Yeah. I don't think it happened all that often, but it was, it was, it was really dumb. And obviously you don't get the same kind of fun radio content that we, you know, enjoy mostly for the, the comedic factor. Um, but also it does give you a, a pretty good insight on what's happening in the car. Yeah. I mean, Yuki would have to have like a two lap penalty just sitting, waiting in the pit to go. Yeah, well, Yuki's probably going to have a couple penalties this year for saying curse words if that uh, rule is uh, going to be it's enforced, so which I, dumb, I, don't I don't like it. Like, I understand we need to protect the radio at some point, but, like, the cursing mm-hmm. thing is dumb. Yeah, so which, dumb. for context, go back to our uh, winter break news recap, um, where we talked about how the FIA has basically instituted a new rule that says that, you know, drivers can't use profane language while on radio, which, poor Yuki, that's going to be a rough one for him. Oh, my God. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Any and other key takeaways? One more, one more bit. We... Yeah. Okay, Perfect. Yeah, so, so the last key takeaway, um, and this is like a really minor thing, is the post-race interviews for the podium, instead of happening right after you hop out of the car, it happens after you're on the podium and after the podium ceremony is done, which I think could never happen these days because ESPN really just wants to punt to whatever programming they have instead on a Sunday morning that isn't Formula One. Um, but I I don't know. I kind of really enjoyed it. Like it was, you know, it, the same same group of guys pretty much who, who, are, do, who are doing the interviewing then, who are doing it now. Um, former Red Bull driver Mark Webber did a bunch. David Coulthard. Um, Mark Brun- Martin Brundle did, did a, a bunch of them, some other, you know, personalities around the sport. They got a couple of local people, uh, Jared Butler, the actor was the one who was doing the interviews at Kota. Um, yeah, that was, that was a, a fun little, little cameo. Um, I just, I just thought it was really interesting and I don't, I don't, I don't know. If I kind of like, like it. it. Yeah. I kind of like it. I like that idea. Well, mostly because I feel like they get out of the car and they like, throw the watch and the hat of the sponsor on and then they have the microphone in their face and it's like let them breathe a bit like we love the cool down content because they've had like a second and they're cooling down they get to watch some you know footage whatever I think I'd like that more because then they'd have like more time to digest look and see some things and they maybe it would be a better interview but I don't know I, I I mean, honestly, I think it's whatever Sky Sports wants to do, not ESPN, because ESPN is such a small market. But um, I don't know. It'd be interesting. Yeah, it, it was it, it was a little jarring to me just because I had, you know, I'm so used to our post-race routine um, with, with the interviews. But I mean, I, I think I feel like it's the, the same quality of, of the types of questions that you get. Um, sometimes they, they'll really like dig into something dramatic that happened on, on track and try to like get them to say things. Um, but, you know, they they had the, they have those you have. I think that the cool down room content now is better than it was back then because sometimes it would just be like dead air when they didn't want to talk to each other, which also was probably just because Lewis and Nico never talked to each other and 
by and large, they were in the cool down room together a lot. Um, and spoiler alert, they're not friends. They're not fond of each other. Love it. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I think you'd maybe get a longer interview if it's after the awards because they're like rushing through everything to get to like podium. But I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, it was it was pretty it was pretty formulaic. You go to the winner, you okay. go to P two, you go to P three, and then you go back to the winner. Um, and he he basically does does final thoughts. Um, and it, it you know really it it was it was really you know quick easy type of thing sometimes it would be a little bit longer than the others um i don't i think that the only thing of the format that is really different is that this time it just happens immediately out of the car rather than yeah. waiting until after the podium so yeah eh, i i think it's kind of cool though especially if you have a podium where the fans can be you know they can come out and be under it like monza um that's where i think that it would be cool to do it up there where more people can see it than doing it down you know at the end of the pit lane by the that garages no, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. I, I like that uh, observation. I think so. Now that we've set the stage, I want to talk races. And yes. I'm a firm believer in personal favorites versus, you know, majority, general favorite, whatever. So for these races, the 21 races that you watched, I want to know, I'll give you – I mean, you already probably have these, but I want to know your your personal top three races, and then the other, like another three that are absolute must watches, very big for different reasons, one way or the other of this season. Okay, so start with your favorites, your top three. So my top three races, we have to start with Australia. Um, first race of the year so it really gives you like the like crash course introductory context of who what where how etc like all of that but it was really it was really highlighted by two things one Nico Rosberg beating Lewis Hamilton to start off the season especially be, you know Lewis coming off of his championship in 2015 but number two is Fernando Alonso had a truly terrifying crash that came out of nowhere his mclaren just went flying off into a runoff area i think it flipped a couple of times he ended up upside down um it was it was one of those like really scary crashes that you're you're really not sure how he was able to i wouldn't say walk away from it because he was injured he did have a little like i I think they said something about him having a, a punctured lung. Um, so he did miss the, the following race, but it was pretty, it was pretty scary. Um, and then. Is this the race? Sorry. Is it, this is the race where like, it's the constant, not loop footage, but it's always like when they show bad crashes, this is that Fernando Alonso crash. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's scary. Pre-Halo yeah. days. Ooh. Pre-Halo. And what was really, really interesting, so this was two years away from the Halo. The Halo was what came in 2018. Um, but Martin Brundle was like, I don't understand. If there's a Halo, how is a driver supposed to get out of the car? What if they get caught in it? And just like, obviously that was a valid, legitimate concern of the, the time with the introduction of the Halo because it put something ba above a driver's head um, and it just, it completely... It's one of the, the most significant changes in, you know, the the way a car is structured and the way that the, the seat portion of the car is structured. But it just like in hindsight and considering how valuable we see the halo now for things like Roman Grosjean's 2020 crash where his car exploded in a ball of fire and split in half. Um, like it just it was it was really you know hot chuckle a little bit to to hear Brundle being I don't know about this you know halo thing um and then the it's crazy that we didn't have it like to oh, think yeah. back also like that yeah it's just like naturally obviously of course we have it but to think back like there were days before when we didn't like is wild yeah, like, you know, NASCAR has, you know, roll bars built into the vehicle, but they're nothing built into the top of a, there hadn't been anything built in the top of a Formula One car in, you know, in, in the somewhat likely event of the Formula One car rolling over. Insanity. Yeah. 
what if we didn't have the halo that one time that Max's car basically ended up on top of Lewis's head? Or exactly. Jovan use um, Silverstone. Oh, that would have been bad. Really bad. Yeah. Um, and then the, the other big takeaway from, from that race um, was it, it really goes to show you that the Ferrari we have today with the questionable strategies and the, the you know, pain making feelings of, uh, that, I that Ferrari fans about. go through, that, that we have no idea what Emily goes through week in and week out. That is a fact of the team and and ferrari made some some typical ferrari strategies back then um and that really told me that you know this is something that we we have seen for most of the seasons that ferrari has been in formula one and it is not something new that we have today it's in our blood catherine it builds character it is let us have this (laughs) sure Sure, sure, sure. Like, keep it on your side of the fence. We don't want it. It's all yours. Red, Red Bull doesn't need it. They have their own problems. Okay. So Australia. That's yes. one. We need two yes. more races. So give me another one. Um, I have to go with Christian Horner and Jerry Hallowell Horner's anniversary uh, race in Spain. I think you mean Ginger Spice, but continue. Yes. The Ginger Spice <laughs> Mrs. Horner, um, Spain 2016, the race day was their one year anniversary. Um, and not only is that a reason to, to watch the race, um, but primarily it is a reason uh, to watch because of the drama at Mercedes. Um, there was a, it, the iconic first lap crash between Rosberg and Hamilton um, that just set off like the amount of times they were cutting off to cameras in the, the Mercedes, you know, hospitality area, their RV back and forth, you know, important people coming in, Toto going up, um, an angry, still helmeted Lewis going up, Nico going up, Nikki Lauda, who was a special advisor to the team um, going up there to, to have their, their little um, meeting, their, their little uh, post-mortem of one of the um, more recent and most embarrassing Mercedes moments of all time. Um, and while that was happening in the background, um, Max Verstappen, who was just recently, had just recently moved to, from, to Red Bull from uh, Toro Rosso, um, became the first Dutch driver to win a Formula One race. He became the like he he broke basically every Dutch record in Formula One and every youngest driver record in Formula One for a single race in Spain. So you're saying Spain 2016 is the day it all ended, and that's when we started hearing the Dutch national anthem on repeat. I mean, no, um, but also it's, this was the start. It's the day the music died. That is, that's <laughs> the day. That's the day it all started. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and one of the, like, the kind of like entertaining moments is, you know, Max Verstappen's father, Jos Verstappen, uh, former Formula One driver, you know, very um, stern presence individual. in the garage, <laughs> uh, questionable parenting skills. Um, he was pretty emotional um, at this first win, um, but Ted Kravitz, everyone's favorite pit lane reporter, was just as emotional as Max's father was interviewing him immediately after the race. It was why pretty. I don't know the context why, um, but Ted would t- Ted definitely got a little emotional there. It was very exciting. Um, a lot of, lot of fun. So definitely. And also, you know, a break from what at the time had been, you know, Mercedes dominance forever or Mercedes and Ferrari dom- dominance, you know, go, it really kind of had been going back and forth those last couple of years. Interesting. Yeah. Honestly, Ted strikes me as a crier. Not gonna yeah. lie. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Oh God. I'm so glad I never watched that race. I'm honestly, it's been a nice break from the Dutch national anthem, but I'm sure we'll just be hearing it in a, you know, month or so here. I mean, we might be hearing God save the King if Lando is able to get a, get a win or two out of the the season. McLaren seems to be thinking pretty positively about their car with the way that their marketing is going these days. Yeah. Well, we'll see about that. Okay. So last race, I'm, I want to take a guess here. Hmm. I'm going to guess 
it is the race that you would bring back, which is Malaysia. Bingo. Um, it it was definitely a really exciting race. Um, also, it was a, a pivotal race for for the um, World Drivers Championship season. Um, Lewis Hamilton had kind of been on an upswing at the time, whereas Nico Rosberg was having a little uh, Checo esque struggle bus bit. You know, mi- was there a double midway DNF? through the season? <laughs> there was not a double DNF. Um, so that, that so basically. Nico Rosberg dominance, Lewis Hamilton dominance. Nico Rosberg came back a little bit, then Lewis Hamilton ended the the season. But Malaysia, um, Lewis had um, his. That was the the race where Lewis's engine kind of exploded on him in the middle of the race, so he DNF'd. Um, but it really that plus Suzuka, which was the following weekend, um, really, in my opinion, based on on what was able to happen and how. Rosberg was able to hold on to the championship win because he finished second in the final four races that Lewis did win. Um, that Malaysia and Suzuka were really the two that sunk Lewis's driver's championship chances. Um, and that's why so Kevin it, likes it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a it's a pivotal moment, yes, but also also yes. I'm seeing a theme here. Spain, are, are there were issues with Mercedes. Theme? Malaysia issues with Lewis. Hey, you said my personal we're, top three. So. We're checking all the boxes. H. Fernando Alonso, check in this episode. Mention the double DNF, check. check. Remind everyone that Catherine hates Lewis and Mercedes, check. Check. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Um, but this was also the the first race that um, Esteban Ocon, who had just joined the grid midway through the season, he got a couple penalties, which was just leading Stop. him into his career as one of the most penalized guys on the grid. Love it. Yeah. God but also, Esty, and you're, you're, you're going to, to appreciate this too, this was Daniel Ricciardo's first win in two years. Um, and it was really really exciting um it was red bull's first one two since 2013 um and there were some fun you know on track racing max versus daniel that i think we need to see more of and that i am looking forward to seeing in some way this season um and also featured the best podium of the season featuring shoeys from not just danny ricardo but also christian horner max <gasps> verstappen and nico rosberg did a shoey out of daniel's shoe Mm -hmm. stop oh my gosh okay I need to find this podium just to watch it because I I I, if you see Nico Rosberg there's no way you're like oh yeah that man would do a shoey out of Daniel Ricardo's shoe like that's just Mm -hmm. not on his bingo card in life um oh yes yes yeah and then Mark Webber who had been made by Daniel to do a shoey um earlier this season he um as soon as he came out to do the post-race interviews um he grabbed Daniel's shoe and chucked it off the podium he's like I'm not doing it again love that's awesome oh yeah great so okay if you if you're gonna watch anything out of Malaysia you gotta watch that podium but also no I'm watching it it was great I'm watching it yeah no it sounds like it sounds like it Okay, yeah. so those are your personal top three favorite for <coughs> reasons we won't read. <laughs> <coughs> Mercedes not doing well. Um, but what are some other, let's not do some because we could talk about the other, you know, 18 races. But what are three other races that were pivotal, big highlights, races we should talk about? Yeah. So first one is Monza. Um, Monza, it was a, a really key mid-season battle between Lewis and Nico. Um, Lewis was up uh, two points in the driver's championship at the time. The podium was next level. Awesome. Like, uh, and we, there was a Ferrari driver on the podium. So it was just, it was amazing um and and then the the other thing that i that i noticed um that kind of explains uh explains a little bit is um mercedes had white race suits back then and um white gets see-through when you get sweaty and so the mercedes drivers got out of the car and it was like oh there's there's two issues Watch Monza see Tushy. <laughs> yes, it, it was it was very much like oh that's why those race suits aren't white anymore. Moment. Oh my gosh. Yeah, like um, that's such next... a design flaw. Like how hard is it to like 
understand oh god okay. especially Anyways. since they're wearing long underwear under those things but anyway um or maybe they weren't the the un- the underoos rules were probably different back then um <laughs> the next the next much watch must watch race um is definitely mexico obviously we've talked about how much we love mexico we love um, mexico it, it was um it was it was great less so for the battle at the front you know Hamilton Rosberg had that taken care of, but the Verstappen Vettel Ricardo battle was really exciting. Um, they were they were fighting for position all race. Max had a penalty. The end of the race was pure chaos because if you remember, um, at the end of the race um in in mexico the podium is in the middle of the stadium section so the the top three drivers park their car in this in the stadium section max was p3 vettel was p4 um max ends up getting yanked out of the podium because he's immediately assessed a penalty um after the race for i don't even remember what it was but it was something that happened toward the end and vettel has to be escorted by like all the Ferrari mechanics and, and, you know, media staffers all the way for the stadium section, which is not a short distance away. Um, and then he, he's like taken, you know, behind the barrier into the cool down room. So that further delayed the podium. Um, and then they had, and then, and then he was on the podium for the first time in a while, but to note is that following the race, Vettel also lost P3 um, because he had said some inflammatory verbiage to race director Charlie Whiting about his battle with Verstappen. So that t- that knocked him down and basically Ricardo inherits P3. And it's dinner and time. And it's for the dinner cat. time. <laughs> Check. Yeah. <laughs> check um so so yeah so it was quite the the chaotic ending to the to, to the race um and it, it's definitely one of those you should you should check that out i mean having a driver get yeeted out of a cool down room is not something you see very often well it's like this last season where it's like fernando you were p3 just kidding it goes to george just kidding it just actually kidding. goes back to fernando yeah <laughs> oh gosh Lovely. Oh, yeah. sad. And then, last but not least, Abu Dhabi. I, I wouldn't... It was... So that was the race that decided the championship. It, it was one of those, you know, one of those years where it did go down to the final race of the year. And it was pretty dramatic. Lewis was ahead of Rosberg. Um, there, the criteria... Wa- Criteria wise, um, there were four ways Nico could win, and there were five ways that Lewis could win. Maybe it was reverse. One of the two. Um, so there were a lot of different scenarios at play, but the biggest one is that if Lewis won, Rosberg could finish third and still be okay. Ultimately, he finished second, um, but Sebastian Vettel was on Nico Rosberg's back the entire like last 15 laps of that race. Um, and Lewis was, Lewis was on cruise control up at the front. Um, and he was directed by his race engineer, Bono, uh, to speed up a little bit. And Lewis just didn't respond. Um, cause it would have, it would have, the, the benefit is it would have given Nico a little bit more breathing room. Right. Um, and, and that, so he could, you know, better fend off Vettel. Um, and then behind Vettel was Verstappen and, but, um, had Rosberg been overtaken by Vettel and Verstappen, then Lewis would have won the championship. And Lewis was basically doing everything possible to back Rosberg up to put that situation in play. Um, and then Patty goes on the radio and says, Lewis, please speed up, give, give Nico a hand here and Lewis basically responded with I like my speed I'm good what a G yeah the the Rosberg fans were not thrilled um Nico was uh definitely also not thrilled um and you know Seb was just doing anything possible to get a better result for Ferrari especially since Ferrari had fallen down the constructors championship standings to third um and just giving them every bit possible they also had a bit of a fall off you know midway through the season um and it led to an awkward as hell cool down room. I mean, there had been a lot of awkward cool down rooms, um, but this this cool down room, you've got 
really, really happy Nico Rosberg and really, really not happy Lewis Hamilton. And they are just not looking at each other. And we wonder why the interviews these days are awkward. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, and it also led to like a really like downer of a podium. Um, one of the things that stood out is obviously the, um, the first place trophy is big. The second place trophy is smaller. Um, when they were handing out the trophies, Lewis obviously got the first place trophy and then Nico accepted the constructor's trophy and lifted that to celebrate his world driver's championship win. Um, and then the person who had come up to accept the constructor's trophy for Mercedes, he took the P2 and they eventually traded back. Um, but like, it was one of those things where like, you knew Nico did that on purpose to hold the oh, yeah. trophy. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh my God. And, and it was just like the, it, it was, it was um, obviously like Nico was incredibly emotional. Lewis was just like, not happy. The two of them were like, you know, cordial. They were made to shake hands and, you know, and, and pretend that they were supportive of each other, but it was, it was very cringy. Um, Nico, when he was asked about the race, he's like, Oh my God, that sucked. I'm so glad that's over. Um, Cause he, he was under threat for a very long time. Um, yeah. So it was, it was definitely, one of those um there were better podium moments but they, they you know he he also really got to celebrate I, I thought it was interesting um Nico Rosberg's father Kike Rosberg also drive a uh, world drivers champion um it was in the 70s he was not actually at the race or wherever he was he was not watching from the garage um because Nico did mention in the podium interview that his father and mother were on their way um and I don't know where they were watching the race from but it was not with the rest like um hit, Nico's wife was down in the um in the garage she actually got to um she they gave her a headset and let her call into him on the radio when he was doing his pull down lap. So it was very Aww, cute. That's yeah. so cute. Yeah. That's adorable. Yeah. So, but I, I just really thought it was interesting. Like I, I wonder where, um, where his dad and mom were watching the race from obviously like Carlos signs, his father, Carlos signs senior. He rarely comes to, to races because he wants Carlos to, you know, have the formula one career without having, you know, Carlos signs senior just, you know, over his shoulder. Um, but I, I just, I just thought it was really interesting that like, I don't, where was dad? Yeah. Well, I don't, I mean, you never know parents. Sometimes they get nervous for their kids and they can't watch. Oh, like, obviously. Uh, Oscar Piastri's mom just like, oh, never goes I to love any her. Races Cause she's so nervous. I'm obsessed <laughs> with her, but that yeah. is interesting though. Like, especially if he was a world champion and there was a possibility for him to be world champion at this race, but you never know. Yeah. Also, superstitions, people have those oh, things 100%. too. So you never know. You never know. Athletes have it in spades. Oh, do they ever? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I all I know is I have to watch. It sounds like I need to watch the podiums for all of these races, but I definitely need to watch Malaysia. I want to see everyone do a shoey. <laughs> oh my god, Malaysia. 100 percent worth the watch Sold. i have to find um, that and i'm sure it won't like, be that hard to find yeah it was it was a it was a, a fun race and then i have to add one honorable mention that's fine um, i'll allow it yeah thank you <laughs> is russia 2016 um because that is the race and i am convinced that sebastian vettel single-handedly is the reason why Daniel Kvyat was demoted from Red Bull to Toro Rosso um, because of what happened in Russia. Um, they had their um, Kvyat and, and Vettel had kind of bumped heads the, the weekend before, and then they crashed again in, in Sochi and Vettel legitimately, he gets out of the car and walks straight to Christian Horner on the pit wall and next race, Max Verstappen's right, driving for Red Bull. Wow. We'll never know, yeah. will we? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there were other reasons, and I'm sure it's all been reported. Um, but it was like one of those moments. Like, if you want to watch like the beginning of the race just to see that, and also the race was like the race was a good race. Um, but yeah, like like and Vettel and Horner have had a very close relationship. Obviously, Smash oh, and Vettel won four world championships with Red Bull before yeah. going over to Ferrari. Um, but the way that he just marched to, to Christian Horner race is still happening and is like you gotta do something about your boy it was it was great to see i mean who's not gonna listen to seb though we all love seb of course everyone's a, everyone's a fan of seb 
Yeah, exactly. So it was that was uh, that was uh, Daniel Kvyat's last race in in, in Red Bull before he moved uh, where he was downgraded back to Toro Rosso. God bless. <sighs> okay. Anything else coming out of this season? Were there any like a cool few... things that you or like cool people that you saw? Yeah, there were some notable cameos. Um, obviously, at the time, Nikki Lauda was a. Um, he was a senior advisor, special advisor for Mercedes. Um, uh, Lewis Hamilton has talked about, you know, his, you know, influence over his career, all of that. And it just like, you know, ever since it's pa- his, pa- his passing a few years ago, it's like, it's always cool to like see him, you know, in, in his element, you know, doing what he did with Mercedes. And obviously he was one of the instrumental reasons for Mercedes success, um, you know, at, at that time. So that was, that was really, it's like a really heartwarming, like nice, fun thing to watch. And he, he also like, he was very diplomatic when he was being interviewed, especially when like Lewis and Nico were butting heads, but he was also like, he didn't hold back much either. That's fun. Well, yeah. Um, some we also had on the grid. Yeah. We also had some sightings of a very, very young Pierre Gasly um, toward the end of the year, hanging out in the Alpha Tower, or I'm sorry, the, the Toro Rosso garage. Um, there were rumors that he was going to replace Kvyat mid-season. Obviously, that didn't happen, um, but that was one of the, the big rumors of the time. Um, and then watching the Abu Dhabi race, I'm like, Who's that very tall child in the garage? Oh, it's George Russell. And then my um, one of my favorite podium appearances is obviously the winning um, team has somebody to represent them um, on the podium to accept the constructors' trophy. Um, and in Kota, they 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 say, um, oh yes, and Victoria Vowles is coming out with Lewis Hamilton, and I'm just sitting there like Victoria Vowles, James Vowles' wife. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, James. J- yep. Talk about James Vowles. Check. <laughs> Check. Yeah. Always so obviously, into our podcast. Obviously, James Vowles is one of our favorite current team principals. At the time, he was, um, you know, a senior engineer at Mercedes, um, and his wife was. Um, she was a. a I think she worked in, in sponsorship. So she came out with um, Lewis in one of the races that Lewis won. Um, and David Croft on the broadcast is like, yes. And her husband, James, also works for the team. I'm just like, I love that. Oh, also. that's amazing. That's so great. Yeah. It's like Victoria Vowles and also her husband does something for this team too. Yeah. Also, he's kind of a big deal. And, and it was, it was really cute. So, so, um, Rosberg was, was, um, he finished P2. So he was next to her on the the next podium. And so she accepts the trophy and just kind of holds it. And Nico's like, Hey, you know, hold it up, hold it up. And so she, and then she lifted it over her head. It was like, that was like a really like adorable moment. And then they just, they absolutely dunked her in champagne. Like she, they, they just went after her. It was great. That's awesome. That yeah. Is awesome. And then on a, a little bit of a, you know, not surprising, but also kind of downer moment that we have talked about plenty of times is there was a Martin Brundle uh, gridwalk incident also in Coda. <gasps> oh, um, I was where... going to ask you if they did gridwalks, so like if you got to rewatch the gridwalks or what was all included in the rewatch. So um, I forgot to ask so you about the, the, the gridwalks. Yeah, so they did not, unfortunately, they were not able to show, they, so the, the structure of the replay, at least of 2016, is um, af- after the, the intro video starts and they, you know, go into, you know, what the track looks like and Crofty does his read of, you know, the turns, the DRS zones, that's where the broadcast starts and then it dives into the, the pit. So it's after the anthem and after all of that stuff that you see in the pre-show. Um, and of course the gridwalk and the Cota 2016 gridwalk most notably had Venus Williams snubbing Martin Brundle. So he has been snubbed by both Williams sisters on an American grid. Uh I just don't think, you know, the gridwalk works in America for him. I don't think we really, as Americans, I don't think we appreciate oh, what no, the gridwalk absolutely is. Not. No, the Americans because if you, who... if you watch, like, Americans who know, like, celebrity Americans yeah. who know yeah, yeah, yeah. Martin Brundle, like, um, Michael Douglas, like, yes. sought out Brundle to do the gridwalk and, like, did it. And um, Gordon Ramsay always sits and talks to, I mean, granted, he's British, but still sits and talks to him for as long as Martin wants to talk to him. Like, European celebrities get it. 
America, like, oh, what was the ungodly painful one? Machine Gun Kelly. Like, yes, oh my yes. God. I was like, stop, make it stop. Turn it off. Turn it off. It's so bad. But no, Americans just don't understand it. They don't appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, Americans need to need to learn to appreciate the gridwalk. It's a, it's a 10 second sound bite like like that's that's all you, it doesn't have to be you know it's not dinner in a movie it's a t- it's a 10 second i'm really excited i'm here type of thing um and it's it's martin brundle like let him live um another thing speaking of of martin is um if you want to turn this into a drinking game which i do not recommend um but uh it would be take a drink every time crofty or martin called max or Sappen the teenager in quotes um during that season oh my god i'm sure it happened every single race multiple times oh yes yes love 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 so my question i have another question about this i have a lot of questions but they're just like ruminating in my head and I can't quite formulate them. But I know that you have several friends and also your dad that you talked to about F1. Did you rewatch this with any of them or like do this process with any of them or did you just do this on your own or did you talk to anybody throughout this process? Because we we did Um, not talk. So for everyone who wants to know, like we did not talk at all because I didn't want to like get up. She would like reach out and dm me in instagram because we don't talk in any other form um and be like oh my gosh this race oh my gosh i'm watching oh my gosh but i wouldn't know any like what she was watching or anything like that but did you talk to anyone officially about any of this while you were doing it or did you just like silo yourself um primarily siloed myself the one thing that i would find myself wanting to do is Obviously, I, we, you and I DM all the time when we're watching a race. I'm during races. I'm also always texting with my dad because he's watching in California. Um, one of the things that I felt myself doing is like um, Lewis would make a comment about how his tires were gone on the radio, and I would have the urge to just like grab my phone and be like, "Ugh, Lewis is bitching about his tires again." <laughs> um, and then I'd remember that I'm the only one watching this race right now, and that nobody has the contact for that but me. I wish you would have messaged me and been like, oh my God, can you believe that radio call? And I'd be like, I'm sorry, it's a Tuesday. I don't know what you're talking about. I know. So like the like at, at one point I I did I I I texted my dad I'm like I was about to text you Lewis is being Lewis is whining on the radio right now and then I realized that I'm watching China 2016 and you have no context for what the hell I'm talking about. I love when that happens though like or all like in different situations in life and I'll text someone and they'll be like what are you talking about I'm like oh nope just me okay nope sorry context sorry context oh my gosh um yeah yeah oh I I wish you would have because for some of this you because you did preface and give me context sometimes you'd be like oh my gosh I'm on the sixth race of the season and there's a lot to talk about or stuff like that but I wouldn't know anything else because we wanted to keep it very like separate so secret um, secret yeah secret secret yeah there, and there did get to a point where I based on on our our recording schedules like there was a point where I was like oh I have to watch 10 races in two days <laughs> um and then all of the news about the uh like uh, the then the, the the wolf stuff came out and the the alpha Gunther male name moved, stuff came out Gunther, Gunther got, left, you know getting yeah. fired um so I was like okay this gives me this gives me time so I, I only have to watch three races a day and not six um because like some <gasps> some of those races the you know some of those races did have red flags some of those red flags did last a little bit of time and they they have the entire broadcast and I sat through all of those red flag periods including um one of the the last races of the season not the, not Abu Dhabi but one of the later races was um there there was a lot of rain involved and um so there there was some some pretty long red flag periods where they were almost talking about like half points um and how that was going to affect the championship so it, it, it they they were doing the math up there in the commentary oh, box yeah when they start doing the math that's when you know it's like bad (laughs) yeah exactly oh my gosh well 
yeah. Thank you for watching this season for me and the listeners and the fans and everybody on the planet Earth who did not watch this. Much, much appreciated. So overall, Absolutely. zero to ten. Actually, no. Let's do this. If you were to give this race a position, P1 to, we currently have 20, so P1 to P20, would it be in the points or not in the points? Oh, definitely in the points. Um, this, this was, this was a, um, this was a good season. Um, there were, there were, there were a number of races where I was like, oh my gosh, do I really have to watch all 21 of these races? Um, and, but I sat through every minute of them, obviously not every single race of a season is going to be a banger. Like we know that. And obviously I'm crazy to binge watch, you know, a bunch of races in the span of a week. I did not binge watch every single race in the span of a week. I did want, you know, watch all of these over a couple of months. Um, but yeah, this is definitely in the points. This is definitely high up in the points. Um, obviously so what, this is so a significant P, shit. How many points are we getting? I, give it, so P- I would, I would give it, I give it like P3. You know, oh, okay. considering considering I've watched in full tw- 2023, 2022, and now 2016, and, you know, half of 2021, that's four seasons. Um, I got to give P1 to 2021 because that was, you know, obviously one. Um, and, you know, um, so I think that, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, if I want to, you know, sit here right now and, and, you know, put these four seasons in a, in a, in a positions, but I would, I would definitely put 2016 up there pretty high. I think it was, it was a really good, really exciting season. Obviously the Mercedes dominance is very similar to what we're seeing right now with the Red Bull dominance. Um, but it was definitely worth a watch and obviously historically significant but if you're gonna watch you know six of the 21 races the six that i listed plus the one honorable mention highly recommend perfect well yeah are you up for another season oh yeah let's do this again okay uh i'm gonna pick your season this time okay hit me with it i feel like i liked your your pick of Nico Rosberg's like world championship, you know, 2016. I feel like we do 2010 because we've been mentioning okay. Seb a lot in this episode, and that's Seb's first world championship. So I think that'd be a good season. Plus, I think it's going back even further to different regulations. We're getting even oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. further back. Maybe 2010, we don't have 11 drivers that we're familiar with. So I think 2010 would be a really interesting season for you to to uh, watch. Yeah, I'm into it. All right. Uh, I will watch every race of the 2010 season. And at some point, we will have an episode and talk about my <laughs> thoughts. We need to give you a few more months to watch it. <laughs> yes, this, this, this will not be coming out anytime soon, but it will come out at some point. <laughs> eventually it's an off week episode sometime in the in the upcoming season yeah exactly um we are promising another f1 recap of previous seasons tbd on the release date yeah you gotta i I have a i have a an amount more uh free time than emily does we we know that (laughs) that is a fact um but this was still a lot of races and i have a lot of csi new york to rewatch so i need a little bit of time wait i'm sorry we're gonna pause on that you're a csi new york fan oh my god it's my favorite of the csis no everyone knows miami is the best horatio don't get me wrong are you kidding me I love Miami, love Horatio Kane. take off sunglasses, make witty comment, put on sunglasses, cut to opening credits. But like CSI New York has a special, special place in my heart. Gotta love the blue tones, gotta love the New York City of it all. Um, but anyway, coming Anyways, up next, back on we track. will have our... <laughs> getting getting back on track we got a, a lot of, of uh current events to talk about so we will be bringing you a uh, another winter break news roundup formerly known as soon to be known as visa cash app something or other maybe we'll see oh god the remaining it's gonna be weird teams. i swear our new like in five years all of the team names are gonna sound like american football plays like 99 red short swing cut <laughs> like dagger or something like that it's gonna they're and so over it it's gonna be stupid but anyways 
I really enjoyed this episode, even though I feel like I did not add anything to it. I'm so glad <laughs> we did it. <laughs> This is a perfect demonstration of mine and Catherine's relationship and how busy I am versus like how much time she has to watch the whole season. But no, yeah. I also I also like think it's interesting to hear other people's perspective on races and like why I should watch something because I don't blindly like watching things. I like to get some I like to read the reviews, you know? So yeah. now that I know and this I is a P three season. And now that I know this is a P three season, I'm more likely to watch it, especially some of the podiums. So yes. I really enjoyed this episode. Um, but this that has been our episode, the F101 recap of the 2016 season. It's the end of the episode. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. 